It is a timeless truth. One man's junk really is another man's treasure. Sometimes you see something and say, Wow, that's really amazing. What it's worth to you is really what matters. It's part of our history, and we're talking well over 100 years now. But it is exciting to hear an expert say, When you walked in, I was very pleased because it's a wonderful thing. And it's like being hit by lightning. I was totally shocked, you know, about how much this was worth, but I didn't dream it was worth anything. The Antiques Roadshow rolled into the peerless Princess of the Plains in the summer of 2008. I know you have all been waiting to see Antiques Roadshow from Wichita, and guess what? The wait is over. It was a huge event. 6,000 excited people packed into Century 2. Do you want me to pinch you? Yeah. <laughs> I want to pinch me. <laughs> Fast forward to today, and the antiques are even older. Some are worth more dollars, some are not, but the memories are still priceless. So are many of these items, at least to their owners. Let's take a look. I think most often it's not about the money. It's about what they can tell them about the history of the piece, you know, um, and, and how it fits into the, the big picture um, with antiques. John Boldenow collects walking sticks, and in 2008, he brought a couple doozies to the road show. I knew that they were extraordinary. I've been, I, as an actor, I was working as an actor still at the time, and. Um, it was one of the few things, uh, if you bought that, that kind of thing and then actually used them in a show, it could be used as a tax write-off. So I had started collecting walking sticks and um, vintage eyeglasses and that sort of thing a long time ago. Boldenow says he bought these for a couple hundred bucks several years ago from another collector in Wichita. I've always had a passion for walking sticks. I remember my grandfather always carrying one out into the pasture to bring the cows in. and smacking them, you know what I mean, keep them coming in. Walking sticks have a long history of serving multiple purposes. Moses used one for herding sheep, and it also came in handy for him as a demonstration tool. In this you shall know that the Lord is God. <laughs> in the 17th and 18th centuries, walking sticks replaced swords as popular fashion accessories for European gentlemen. Right after the Civil War, a lot of veterans that were put into um, uh, government-run facilities to care for them late in their life, um, to keep themselves occupied, very often they were making walking sticks. That was one of the things that, that they were quite famous for because a lot of the vets needed them. Of course, they've always been helpful walking aids and handy as tools for self-defense. Whether walking sticks and canes are the same thing depends on who you ask. Boldenow considers walking sticks to be one-of-a-kind creations, often in a rural folk art style, such as these crafted by artist Robert H. Craig. A gentleman who was working in a folk art tradition, you know, with a, with a pocket knife, and, and these were definitely uh, folk art walking sticks. They're actually very sophisticated. There's all kinds of Masonic symbols and stuff on them, too. One of the sticks, uh, the slimmer one here, was made in 1881 uh, by Mr. Craig, and the other one in 1902. And you can kind of see the progression of, of, uh, of his carving style. Appraiser Alan Katz didn't know anything about Robert H. Craig. Nobody seems to. But he did know these sticks are valuable, especially one of them. This one over here, we use the expression, it escapes the form. <laughs> okay, so we look at this, we see a cane. Okay. If you look at this, it's much more than a cane. Okay. It's really almost a totem of American folk carving. This is one of the best ones I've ever seen. Wow, that's great. Wow, look at what they were worth in 2008. But times change. Nevertheless, Boldenow says he has no intentions of ever selling these. At the appropriate time, he plans to donate them to an art museum. <laughs> Meanwhile, Amy Crouch Coleman still has the Art Deco necklace she took to the road show. At the time, she had had it for several years having spotted it while window shopping with her husband in Manhattan, Kansas. We passed an antique store, 
Um, I saw it in the window and said, wow, that's really amazing. Um, went in and took a look at it because um, I have a, a thing for art, the Art Deco period. Um, as an interior designer, it, it really speaks to me. Art Deco is a style that emerged in France around 1910. It influenced the design of everything from buildings and furniture to cars, movie theaters, and jewelry. It's on that cusp of modernism. Um, it's a complete departure from the Victorian era and the Art Nouveau period. Um, and it, it's, I think of Hollywood glamour. I think of steam vessels like the Titanic and all of those kinds of lines. Water was big in the Art Deco period. Egyptian motifs were big in the Art Deco period. Um, and just the colors were interesting. They weren't, you know, it wasn't the same deep reds and, and jewel tones of the Victorian era. It was softer salmon tones, silver, gold. It was all about glam. And while some trendy styles of the past seem positively garish by today's standards, Art Deco seems to have a timeless appeal. I mean, a lot of people um, see Art Deco style and think it's quite modern. And it, it's really kind of fun to wear this out. And people say, oh, where'd you find that? You know, <laughs> well, you can't find it anymore. It's not made. <laughs> But the appraiser had some not so great news. The piece actually started out as a brooch. So what we call this is a marriage. This is not a great marriage. In its present condition, I would say it's worth somewhere between $200 and $400. Yay! Nevertheless, it is a one-of-a-kind piece made at the prestigious Kalo Arts and Crafts Community House in Chicago in 1935. That was a school and workshop for silversmiths and jewelry makers that operated from 1900 to 1970. Many of the pieces made there bring high prices at auction and populate collections at prestigious art museums. It was a $40 purchase. Um, so I was very surprised when he said if they had left it as a pin, it would, as a brooch, it would have been worth in the thousands of dollars. The jewel is rose quartz. While it may not carry the value or cachet of a diamond or a ruby, Coleman says she loves this now more than ever. When my husband takes me out for dinner, um, I like to wear it. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a pretty heavy piece, so I'm not gonna wear it working around the house. But um, when we go out for a date or we go to see friends and I happen to be wearing something that it, it works well with. I like to wear black because it really makes that that um, the quartz really pop out. So, you think she'd ever sell it? No. No. Um, simply because I love it so much. I'll leave it to my girls. You know, I'll let them fight over it. <laughs> the plan of succession is already activated for the Mennonite dowry chest that Tom Voth brought to the road show. When my mom uh, uh, was passing on items to the family, she said, I want to see this stay in the Voth family. Um, so she said, you don't sell it, <laughs> not, not allowed. <laughs> it has already been passed down to the next generation, but Voth was happy to meet us at his nephew's house to show it off. This chest uh, has been in our family since the uh, 1860s. Uh, it came from uh, South Russia. It was uh, owned by a young woman named Anna Franz. It was her dowry chest. Dowry, or hope chests, date back as far as the 15th century in Europe. Particularly prominent in the Mennonite tradition, these wooden chests were a place for young women to collect clothes, linens, and so forth in anticipation of married life. Many of those families, having already emigrated to Russia from Germany, fled to the United States in the 1870s and 80s in search of freer, more prosperous lives. Since space on steamships was limited, many families used dowry chests as travel trunks, and that was all they could bring. You see these, these metal uh, knobs, metal whatever, on the front and the back, and it's, it's our understanding that when they immigrated from Russia to the United States. They would, of course, come by ship. They didn't have airplanes in those days. 
And so these knobs were put on there so they could stack the chests in the cargo areas and they wouldn't scratch the tops up. Both says he doesn't know anything about Anna Franz other than she was his great-grandfather's first wife and died young. He says it's likely that Anna's dowry chest was either purchased from a Russian craftsman or made by her father or someone else close to her. It's not expensive wood, it was pine. And you can see the, uh, the detail on the front is painted. Uh, this was typical of families that were not uh, that moneyed is to have them painted. Uh, some of the other chests that came over were actually inlaid wood and that indicated that the owners were a bit more uh, wealthy. Uh, but this one, these were, these were simple farm folks. Glued to the underside of the lid are pages of pamphlets or books, some in German, some in Russian, that relate to faith and young married life. There's also some artwork that apparently Anna herself drew. She had some artistic uh, ability. In 2008, Roadshow appraiser Ken Farmer said the chest was worth $3,000. I was hoping for more but uh, it, was, it was still pretty exciting. Voth and the Chess didn't make the cut for the Vintage episode, which was a one-hour compilation of the three hours originally broadcast from Wichita. So there is no new appraisal. But Voth says it doesn't matter. He says while he loves the show and loved being on it, this chess can never be as valuable to anyone else as it is to him and his family. Mark McClurg was not on the Vintage episode either, but his appearance on the original version of the show was something he'll never forget. It was just, it was a very exciting day. It, uh, I've been loved antiques all my life, and it's just so cool to be on the Antiques Road show, or to go to it even. <laughs> McClurg brought this framed decorative ceramic tile. He didn't know anything about it other than he has admired it his entire life. Uh, it's been on my mom's wall ever since I was a little boy. And I can remember looking at it and admiring it from when I was real little. McClurg says his mother got it at a Wichita flea market. But the tag on the back indicates the tile was originally purchased at the Emporium in San Francisco. That was a famous department store, a shopping destination for locals and tourists for 100 years until it closed in 1996. Selling imported art like this was one of the Emporium's claims to fame. I think it's Art Nouveau, the style, and it's just a, a, a lady with long flowing hair, and it, it, the colors on her are so vibrant, and it's really pretty to me. The Roadshow appraiser immediately knew where this piece was made. She told McClurg it was crafted around the year 1900 at a German art factory named for its founder, Johann von Schwartz. The business closed in 1921, but much of what it produced still survives. McClurg suspected it was worth very little, but boy, was he wrong. I was totally shocked, you know, about how much this was worth, but I didn't dream it was worth anything. The appraisal, $1,500 to $2,000. Oh, I was flabbergasted. I had no clue that that was worth that much money. But nope, McClurg has not tried to sell it. He's given it to his son, who he hopes will appreciate it like he has. And you know, it's interesting. As all four of these people demonstrate, the value of antiques is not really about money. It's about personal memories, family legacies, holding on to history, or in some cases, just plain beauty. That emotional connection is probably what has made Antiques Roadshow one of the most successful TV shows in history. In 2008, the producers said Century 2 was a great facility to host the show. Response from the community was huge, and the show's crew said at the time it was a great experience. Yet, Antiques Roadshow has visited Tulsa three times, Des Moines and Omaha twice, but Wichita only that one time. Oh, I think they should come back. There's, there are, the, the, the cool thing about Kansas to me, and I was born and raised there, is that you have people that came from all over the world and settled there. So there's a lot of history. 
Um, we have so many German Catholic communities in the state. We have Lindsborg, and so we've got that Swedish connection. There's just a really a lot of people that, that carry their ancestors' treasures with them. Um, that I think they should go come back. If you agree, contact the show and let them know. And keep your fingers crossed. You know, Wichita would be excited. 